We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesustherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesustherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 9 says, God blesses those who work for peace. For they will be called the children of God. Now I don't want to. I don't want to read too much into this, but I was taught in school that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I don't think I'm overstepping anything when it, when it says God blesses those who work for peace. For they will be called the children of God. I don't think it's too much to assume that then God curses those who don't work for peace, and maybe they won't be called the children of God. Verse 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to stand and be a mouthpiece one more time. I thank you for your anointing. And I ask God that you would take away any distraction and anything, God, that would cause us to not hear you. Lord, it doesn't matter so much if they hear me, but I want them to hear you this morning. So you just make your glorious voice to be known. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bishop. Good to see you this morning. Bishop Houston Cunningham and I were doing racial reconciliation before it was a common word. We used to minister together every week. I don't even know that it was reconciliation. We was just conciliating. Maybe, is that a word? We didn't have anything to reconciliate from. We were just brothers, co-laborers, It's an honor to have you here. Appreciate you being here this morning. It's good to see all of you. I scrapped my message that I was going to preach this morning. Sometime Friday night. Given the events taking place over the last week or so, and even previous to that, but it's been escalated again this week, I really felt like that I had no choice any longer that I could no longer be silent on it. This is one of those times when I honestly wish we only had one service instead of two because I'm not sure I want to preach this one time and I'm pretty sure I don't want to preach it twice. But that's the case. I heard a quote Yesterday morning, I was up about five o'clock and I was reading and praying and studying and thinking about this and I had the news on and I heard a quote. You've probably never heard me quote this person. There's a pretty good chance you never will hear me quote them again. But they made a quote and when I heard it, I said, you know, that's it. That's it. Hillary Clinton made the quote. I'm not a big fan, but that's, that's not the point. She was on the news and she said, she said this, she said to the reporter, something has been unleashed in our country, end quote. Something has been unleashed in our country. We have rampant speculations and accusations of 
racist law enforcement, overextending their authority, using lethal force, perhaps when it's not warranted, seemingly primarily against minorities. And so as a result, we have mobs taken to the streets, ambushing law enforcement officers, rioting, vandalizing, murdering innocent people. And you know, the, 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 the sad part is, that's not the real problem. That's only a symptom of the real problem. All we're seeing is the fruits of a bigger problem. But I want to tell you this, if something doesn't happen in this country soon, this nation's headed for another civil war. Not since the civil rights protest in the 60s have we seen such an uprising of civil unrest. Something has been unleashed in our country. Now, just in case you're wondering which side I'm on, let me be very clear, I'm on neither side. I'm on neither side, hence the bulletproof vest. Because I'm probably gonna get shot from both sides. See, I just, I believe murder's murder. I don't care if it's at the hands of a crooked police officer or if it's at the hands of a criminal. Amen. Call me old fashioned. I still believe sin, sin, crime's crime, right's right, and wrong is wrong. I don't care if you're white, black, red, yellow, or green. And trust me, there is enough wrongness to go around. There, there's plenty of wrong. We all got our opinions and our thoughts and we see this and we're outraged and we talk and we stand by the water cooler and we do this. There's plenty of wrongness to go around in this whole situation, in this whole mindset. So I don't care what side you consider yourself to be on. Let me remind you the words of the late Dr. Martin Luther King. Darkness can never drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate can never drive out hate. Only love can do that. You want to know what side I'm on? I'm on the side of love this morning. I'm on the side of light this morning. Paul wrote that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let me tell you something. Prejudice will fail. Anger will fail. Police will fail. Black people will fail. White people will fail. We'll all fail, but love never fails. Love never fails. So, so you can stand and you can shout about black power and white power and police power and this power and that power. I'm going to keep shouting about Jesus power. I'm going to keep shouting about the power of love and the power of mercy and the power of grace and the power of forgiveness. Love never fails. And I want to tell you something just in case you wonder who wins. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Love never fails. You may think you win a battle every now and then. But I promise you, God wins the war. Well, if I haven't made you mad yet, hang on. Let's dig a little deeper. I, I want to point out just, just a little bit of the obvious on both sides of this issue. This is no great revelation. I'm sure you already know this, but I just think it's time we start talking about it. Together, not separately. First of all, civil rights and racial injustice is nothing new in this country. Yeah, something's been unleashed, but it's been there all the time. It's nothing new. African Americans, Native Americans, other minorities have a long history of being horribly abused and mistreated since way before the Civil War. I wasn't born until 1965. But when I go back and I watch the documentaries on the civil rights movement in Selma, Alabama, and Montgomery, Alabama, and different places all through the South, really, I gotta tell you, it, it makes me sick. It makes me sick. I hate prejudice. I hate it in white people. I hate it in black people. I hate it in the workplace, I hate it in the government, I hate it in the school system, and I especially hate it in the church, which is still probably the worst of the whole bunch. When the church ought to be leading the fight against racism, we're still dragging up the rear. So 
So what happens, what happens is this. Often you have a person or a group of people or an entire race of people who have been discriminated against for so long, for so long, pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. And so when they ever break free of it, whenever they get you know, a little, a little bit, just a head above water, let me tell you what happens many times, all of a sudden you have reverse discrimination. You have reverse discrimination. All of a sudden, it's not about just white people hating black people. You got black people hating white people. And then it goes into, it goes into a very socially acceptable thing. Let me, let me give you an example. Guess what we have today? Black Miss America pageant, don't we? We, we, we got black spring break, right? We even have BET, black entertainment television. I tell you, I, I, I'll go a step further. That that uh, we we even have we even have AME Church, don't we? Now I'm not picking on some denomination because of denomination, but it's a, a, American. I mean, African American Methodist Episcopal Church. We're a black church. What kind of uprising would there be in the black community if we had a white Miss America pageant, or a white Spring Break, or a white? entertainment television or a white church. Now, don't get me wrong. We got them, okay? We've got them. We just don't, we don't advertise it that way. But we got, we've got hundreds of thousands of churches across America this morning that are white churches. We, we may not say it. We don't like to talk about it, but we all know that's what it is, right? There's something unleashed in this country. And there's enough wrong to go around. None of us have the monopoly on racism and prejudice. The African-American community has made great strides in the last 50 years. I'm not even sure Dr. King, in all of his dreaming, would have dreamed that we would have an African-American president today. That our government would be led by many great African-American leaders, our entertainment industry, our athletic world, our business world, our technology world, our medical world, our legal world, would, would be filled with African-Americans leading the charge. And in, in many ways, we see his dream being fulfilled right before our eyes. His dream of a nation where people are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That dream, we're seeing it in many ways come to fruition. Maybe that's why I hate so bad to see racism and prejudice being elevated to the place we're seeing it elevated again now. Well, the Clarence Creer did our men's devotion yesterday. And that's one of the things he talked about. He said, you know, we're going forward. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to the 60s. I'm not going back to the Civil War. I'm not going back to a place and a time where this country was, was horribly divided and everyone was pitted against everyone. The world can go back and do it if they want to, but the world be damned. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm going forward. I'm not going to get sucked into the darkness that the enemy is throwing out there as bait to try and destroy this nation and trying to destroy believers. Let me, let me speak real quickly to the so-called vigilante justice that we've witnessed this week. Let me say, first of all, I get both sides of this. I really do. We don't like to because we all got our sides and that's what we're right and they're wrong and you know, that, that, that's, that's all right. I get, both, at least in the flesh I do, at least in my carnal mind, I get both sides of this. When a person or a group of people or a race of people feel like they are repeatedly abused and hurt and killed and discriminated against and they feel like there is no justice, there is no solution, there is no help, nobody cares, nobody will do anything about it, you reach a point where your attitude becomes we are tired of being ignored. We're tired of not having a voice. We may not fix it. We may not repair it. We may not heal it. We may even be wrong and know we're wrong, but one thing we will not be, we will not be ignored any longer. That's the frustration that we're seeing today. 
What we're seeing today is a product of that frustration. And it's worked. Has it not worked? Every major network in the country is talking about it. Presidential candidates are talking about it. Politicians are talking about it. City, state, and federal leaders are talking about it. Law enforcement's talking about it. Heck, we're talking about it. It's worked. Right or wrong, we're talking about it. Are there corrupt law enforcement officers or officers who overstep their boundaries? Absolutely. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Can I tell you, they're also corrupt politicians, if you didn't know that. (laughs) But can I tell you, they're also corrupt preachers and bankers and shipyard workers, and doctors, and nurses. I don't care what field you're talking about. I don't care what race you're talking about. You're going to find corruption, and you're going to find racism, and you're going to find prejudice in any group. White people do not have the corner market on prejudice, in case you're wondering. Prejudice is not a matter of the skin. It's a matter of the heart. But to randomly begin targeting and assassinating any group of people, church is pure evil. It's it's like an airline pilot. If an airline pilot goes into an airport and sits down at a bar in the airport and has four or five drinks and goes and crawls into the cockpit of a 747 and takes off with a plane load of people and crashes that plane into the ground and kills everybody on board. Listen, every person on that plane has family. Every person on that plane has friends and they have a right to be angry. They have a right to be upset. They have a right to want justice. What they don't have a right to do is go pick up a gun and go randomly start shooting airline pilots. The airline pilots are not the problem. This person was the problem. This person was the problem. Real quickly, so you can call it a sermon, let me tell you about a man in the Bible named Moses. Moses was a man who felt the same frustrations and anger that many minorities feel today. Why? Because his people were being held as slaves. They were beaten, they were whipped, they were starved, they were worked like animals, they were mistreated. And day after day after day, Moses watched it and he took it and he took it. Even though he had been raised by the Pharaoh himself, it wasn't directly hurting him. It wasn't directly affecting him. It was still his people. See, sometimes when I see people that are, that are on the camera on CNN and they're outraged and I can't believe it and they're crying in the young because this person got, and this person's three states over, they never heard of them before. They act like they killed their brother. It's not about the person, it's about my people. Moses said, no, nobody's beating on me, but they're beating on my people, the Israelites, and they're slaves in Egypt. So Moses got to the point when Moses couldn't take it anymore. Moses took matters into his own hand. He saw an Egyptian beating up on an Israelite one day. You know what Moses did? He killed him, dead in a hammer. He killed him. But as a result, he had to flee the nation, run for his life, and he ended up in exile for 80 years. You know why? Because Moses said, I'm going to do this thing my way. I'll fix this. Did he fix it? Nope. All of his people still back there in Egypt, and now they're back there without their ally because the ally is out watching sheep, another man's sheep, in exile. So after 80 years in exile, God comes to Moses and says, hey, Moses, guess what? Now we're going to do things my way. Your way didn't work out so well, did it? Now we're going to do things my way. You're going to go back into Egypt, and you're going to tell the Pharaoh that I said, let my people go. 
And Moses went back into Egypt and told the Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. And yeah, it took a little attitude adjustment, but as a result, the people were let go. And we have the stories like the Ten Commandments and the parting of the Red Sea. We're still making movies and writing books and talking about the greatest accident in the history of the world ever because this time Moses did it God's way and not his way. Not, he said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your ways. As the heavens are far above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts above yours. Church, we got to quit trying to do this thing our way. And we got to return and we got to do this thing God's way. The first time it ended horribly. The next time when he did it God's way, it ended victoriously. August 28th, 1963, standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., Dr. King delivered one of the greatest speeches in our nation's history. I have a dream that one day the children of slaves and the children of slave owners will sit down at the table of humanity and they will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream. Now listen, this is what gets me a little bit excited today. This is what gives me a little bit of hope today. This is what makes me really proud today. This church, not only this church, but this church, Church on the Rock in Pascagoula, Mississippi, is not a perfect church. I guarantee you, there are problems in this church. I guarantee you there's pride in this church. I guarantee you there's prejudice in this church. Anytime you have human beings, you're going to have an element of all of these. But hear me. When, when I look out over this congregation, when I walked into men's breakfast yesterday and I saw 60-something men of, of different races, of different social stand, many homeless, many, so, so about, honestly, probably less than half our people. Over half come from the community somewhere. People from all different, when I look out there, when I look out and I look at your faces, when I walk up and I hug your necks and I shake your hands, I want to say to Dr. King, Dr. King, listen to me, the dream is still alive. The dream is still alive. Don't give up on the dream. Don't quit. In fact, in fact, church, I want you to understand something that I hope it excites you the way that it excited me is that in a very real way, we are living the dream right now. We're living his dream. We're experiencing his dream right here, right now. We're doing life together. Blacks and whites and Hispanics and Mexicans and the haves and the have-nots and the upper class and the lower class and the middle class and the no class. We are, we're coming together. And I still have a dream. And I really want to say to Baton Rouge, Louisiana and Dallas, Texas and Atlanta, Georgia and New York City, all across the, all across the nation, that the dream is still alive. It can happen when you do it God's way. It can happen, and not only can it happen, it will happen when you do it God's way. The violence has to stop. The shooting and the killing has to stop. The, the, the more guns, more military, more police, more protests, more killing is not the answer. The answer today is the same answer that it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Black neighbor, white neighbor, rich neighbor, poor neighbor, I don't care what kind of neighbor, love people. The last thing Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I'm giving you, that you love one another the way I've loved you. The same way I've loved you. Paul said, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Are there still black people that walk up to Tick Mosley and probably some of you and say, I can't believe you go to that white church? To which Tick responds, I don't go to a white church. My church is gray with burgundy trim. That's my church. That's my church. That's my church. Do I still have people walk up to me and say, you know, I just don't think black people and white people can worship together, to which I respond, you're right, you don't think. Right. 
Look around you. It's happening. Look around you. It's happening. We're worshiping together. We're doing life together. We're living the dream, church. The dream Jesus shared 2,000 years ago. The same dream Dr. King shared 53 years ago. We're living the dream. The devil is a liar. Don't tell me it can't happen. Don't tell me CNN that it can't happen. Don't tell me black uh, generation that it can't happen. Don't tell me NAACP that it can't happen. Don't tell me police officers that it can't happen. The devil is a liar. It is happening. If it's happening nowhere else, it's happening in Pascagoula, Mississippi. I promise you that because when you do it God's way, it will happen. We're living the dream. We're not a black church, a white church, Hispanic church, Methodist church, rich church, poor church, Baptist church, Methodist church, Presbyterian church. We're just his church. Which, which, in case you're curious, there's only one church because Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The gates of hell are prevailing against this world. Let me tell you something. The gates of hell are prevailing in this nation. But the gates of hell won't prevail against his church. All right, let me close this out. Because I know what some of you are thinking. Well, that may be good for Church on the Rock. But you're never going to change the world. You're never going to change this nation. And you know what? You may be right. You may be right. We may not change the world. We may not change this nation. Bless God, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will do it God's way, not CNN's way. We're going to do it God's way, not black way, not white way. And I promise you, love is contagious. Love is infectious. We can stand in a world filled with darkness and we can be the light. Jesus said, God blesses those who work for peace, for they shall be called the children of God. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And it's high time the church of the Lord Jesus Christ starts acting like the light. Church, let me give you one word of caution in this. Don't get sucked into the darkness. Don't get sucked into the darkness. The enemy wants nothing more than for you to watch CNN or CBS or whatever news show you watch and listen to it 24 hours a day and work yourself up into a frenzy over what somebody's saying and this one's saying and this one did that. Don't get sucked into the darkness. You be the light. You be the light. Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let's not choose sides. Let's choose Jesus. Let's choose love. Yes, it's true something has been unleashed in this country. But I'm telling you, it's time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to unleash something in this country. It's time for us to unleash the spirit and the power and the love of God and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to stand up and be the light of the world. Not to walk into the darkness, not to scream at the darkness, just to turn on the light and be the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there is an answer. Yes, there is an answer. And his name is still Jesus. Amen. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us and have a very blessed day.